Intel's re-refreshed and updated Intel i9-10980XE launches today with availability starting within a few hours of posting. This serves as the company's updated 18-core CPU. Previously, this spot was held by the Intel i9-7980XE and then the i9-9980XE, the latter of which was a slightly higher clocked version of the former, but with solder instead of thermal paste. There were some downsides to this, like the 7980XE being actually a better overclocker without Allen 2 because it could be delitted, but it was an overall lateral move for Intel. Today we're back to look at the 10980XE for review, which will be joined in a few hours by our reviews of the still embargoed Threader for three parts. Before that, this video is brought to you by the Drop and Hi-Fi Man HE4XX Planar Magnetic Headphones. The HE4XX headphones focus on high-quality audio listening experiences with comfortable foam cushions for the ear cups. Comfort is also ensured with a leather-covered spring steel headband, allowing flexibility and durability against bends. These headphones are capable of delivering big sound for audiophiles while being positioned competitively in price. Learn more at the link in the description below. So the 10980XE is an 18-core CPU. The 7980XE was an 18-core CPU circa 2017, and the 9980XE was an 18-core CPU. This is a slightly higher clocked version of the 9980XE. There are some other changes within the architecture as well, but it's not new process or anything like that. AMD's Threadripper parts are launching today as well, and those will be within a couple of hours. So it should be about six hours after the embargo lift for the 10980XE. You'll want to check back for our reviews of those parts. We'll be publishing them in two separate videos. So we're going to have the 3970X in one, then the 39, is it the 60X in the other one. And at time of filming this, the 10980XE review, we actually haven't looked at the Threadripper 3 data, although we've run all the tests, and that's intentionally, so we don't accidentally break embargo in this video. So. Uh, you'll need to check back for those reviews. We're reviewing the 1090DXE somewhat in a vacuum versus the previous Intel parts versus the previous AMD Threadripper part, but not versus obviously the not yet technically released Threadripper 3 parts. We do have the 3950X in here though, and that's really interesting because that's a 16 core that just came out from AMD about a week or two ago. And the 16 core CPU actually posted a lot better performance in some applications than we might have previously expected. So AMD's made a lot of ground on its processors. Intel has the, the name advantage. It's got the 10,980XE. It's got the, the longest processor name we've had to work with. And uh, it's also got some other notes that we need to go through before getting straight into the numbers. So first of all, Intel specs for PL1 and PL2 for this processor. It's 165 watts for PL1, and it's 198 watts for PL2, respectively, uh, for those two. And then the turbo boost duration is recommended at 32 seconds max for the higher of the two for PL2. That would be at 198 watts. That doesn't mean that the motherboard vendors have to follow Intel's recommendations. We always try to follow Intel spec precisely by picking a board that does stick to Intel spec. In this instance, it seems like pretty much all the X299 boards that we have do more or less whatever they want. So they, they have some power limits entered in BIOS, but they all run further away from these PL1 and PL2 numbers and often exit the uh, turbo durations versus what we're used to. Now, it's not as bad as MCE. We're still dropping down, for example, under full load, you'll drop to maybe 3.8 gigahertz or so with all cores loaded. So it's not like it's running at the maximum turbo all the time, which is good because that would be basically MCE and we don't, we don't want to test that. So anyway, uh, something to consider. We'll talk about that more in the power section. And then the cooler differences, we test with a 280 CLC for all of our desktop part reviews, but not HEDT. So for desktop CPUs like the i9, 9900K, 9700K, AMD R7, 3700X, 3900X, whatever, all those parts, basically AM4, LGA platforms, 1151 platforms, we test with a 280 mil Kraken X62 CLC max pump and fan speeds. And then for the HEDT CPUs, we're testing with a 360. So for Threadripper, we use a 360 that we've fixed. It's an Enermax like Tech TR4 cooler. We kind of broke a lot of the news on how just how bad that was. But we have one that was never an issue, and we cleaned it out, purged the fluid, and filled it with a distilled water. So it works really well. So that's our solution for AMD Threadripper. And then for Intel, we use an EVGA CLC360. And that should cover us on the test notes. Otherwise, the rest of it's in all the other testing methodology sections we've written for these CPUs in the past. Let's get into the numbers. We'll start our production benchmarks with Adobe Premiere. We use actual video project files for this, representing both 1080p60 and 4K60 workloads, for our typical YouTube upload. Until recently, Adobe Premiere was a benchmark where Intel reliably held top rank. 
But AMD's Ryzen 3000 series, starting with the R9 3900X, began challenging Intel's dollar-for-dollar -dollar positioning on these charts. Here's the first chart for this one. For our 1080p60 RNG or ENG convention shoot, the Intel i9-10980X eCPU completed the work just shy of 2.8 minutes, putting it within error and test variants of our original Intel i9-9980X e stock benchmark. The Intel 10980X e outperforms the 9980X e at other tests, but here we're within error. Also within striking distance and test error, the 3950X establishes functional equivalence to the 10980XE in this test. The AMD 2990WX, meanwhile, sits at 4.4 minutes for this render, proving that Adobe Premiere is still able to leverage the higher frequency parts alongside cores, but that it values a balance with the former more than a pure cores-driven approach. Overclocking the 10980XE gets it to the top of the charts, sitting at 2.2 minutes and reducing its render time requirement by 21% from the stock result and the 3950X. Overclocking the 3950X doesn't improve its position meaningfully in this chart. For the heavier 4K A-roll and B-roll render, the 10980XE stock CPU requires 7.3 minutes to complete the pass, while the 3950X stock CPU requires 8.2 minutes. Remember that these numbers are just for a shorter test project, but that they will scale mostly linearly against longer projects of the same type. The 10980XE requires 11% less time than the 3950X. If you scaled this up to our modern projects, a 30-minute 3950X render would take about 26 to 27 minutes on the 10980XE. Overclocking the 3950X allows it to leapfrog the stock 10980XE, and then overclocking the 10980XE allows it to lead everyone in this chart. The 6-minute render time is a 17% time reduction from its stock result. The 9980XE is once again within test error and variance and is functionally equivalent at about 12 seconds different. Separately, the 2990WX seems to do exceptionally poorly in this particular test. We retested it actually just before this review went up to double check and the scoring remained the same on our retests with the CPU and the original. Something about this workload just doesn't play well with the threader per part, potentially indicating a scheduling issue. Corpryo also does not seem to help, and yes, we are on the latest version of everything. Let's look at a test where frequency is de-emphasized in favor of raw core and thread count. For this benchmark, we use a GN logo render from our intro animation for one test, then a GN monkey head render that's specifically designed to stress the CPU. This is an AVX workload, and HEDT CPUs are particularly meaningful here, especially for projects which face memory capacity limitations, where you might have issues with, for example, CUDA uh, processing on a lower VRAM GPU. And also, you can run the CPU and GPU in conjunction to render faster. Here's the first chart. The 2990WX still leads the benchmarks with an 8.9 minute render time for a single frame of our intro animation. For GN logo, the 3950X with liquid nitrogen doesn't really count, but it's a fun statistic. That's a 9.4 minute result at 5.2 gigahertz, but it's also at minus 140 degrees Celsius. So let's move on. The 10980XE at 4.9 gigahertz on normal cooling is the true second place result on this bench, followed somewhat distantly by the 9980XE at 4.5 gigahertz. The stock 3950X finishes this render in about 12.2 minutes, outpacing the stock 10980XE with a somewhat remarkable 13% render time requirement reduction while at a two-core deficit and a lower price point. The 7980XE and 9980XE are within error and demonstrate that the frequency delta doesn't really matter when compared to the core count for this bench, although there are times when the frequency delta can help, it's still more thread limited. The 10980XE isn't really improved over the previous X-Series launch for this render, or the one before that. We'll have to keep an eye out for Threader for 3 part positioning at the time of this writing. Remember that we intentionally have not looked at Threader for 3 data yet at all, as it's under embargo still at the time of this video's launch. And we'll have the Threader per video about six hours from publication of this one, so check back for that matchup. The GN Monkey Head Stress Test has the 10980XE at 11.4 minutes, just ahead of the 7980XE and 9980XE, which are again roughly within error of each other. The 3950X outpaces the 10980XE, how's that one for you, stock CPU, with an approximate 11% time requirement reduction, again versus stock. Overclocking the 10980XE, definitely its strength in this matchup, gets it to 8.2 minutes, a reduction of about 13% versus the overclocked 3950X. The 2990WX does surprisingly poorly in this one relative to its previous performance. Our monkey head render seems to have slightly more frequency emphasis than our logo render, which has more thread emphasis. If anything, this just goes to show that the project will dictate performance more than really anything else. So it's important to get a representation of both sides and determine an aggregate result, and we've given you both. 
Adobe Photoshop is the opposite of Blender, still favoring frequency first and foremost. The 3950X did begin to highlight a paradigm shift with this application, but for the most part, the 9900K's domination should make clear that it's frequency that Adobe Photoshop wants. The 9700K at 5.1 GHz also demonstrates this, given that half the thread count runs at parity with the 5.1 GHz and 9900K. This chart is an aggregate summary in points as measured from a base metric of time calculated against filters, blends, transforms, and translates. The 10980XE stock CPU runs this test only slightly faster than the 9980XE, placing at 995 points versus the 9980XE's 989 points. That's a delta of less than 1%, which is variance. This puts the 1090DXE and 9090DXE below even a 3700X or Intel's own i7-9700K stock CPU, which is because of the frequency deficit. Overclocking the 1090DXE to 4.9 GHz all core gets it near the top of the charts at 1139 points. The 3950X is still better value from a cost perspective if ignoring raw performance at 1093 points stock. That said, the 9900K is the best value yet out of these CPUs we've discussed if Photoshop workloads similar to Puget's are the only thing that you do. It's cheaper than the other two, and it's doing better. 7-zip is next. We measure these results in millions of instructions per second, or MIPS, where higher is better. Decompression is one of the preferred tests for 7-zip, with compression as another. Decompression is a common workload, and although there are plenty of examples of heavy use cases, a daily use one would be downloading and extracting large file packs like those found for common driver packages. The 1090DXE processes our decompression benchmark at 153.4K MIPS, placing it about 12% ahead of the Intel i9-9980XE. We need to break from competitive discussion here for some brief analysis. Ignoring that AMD exists in the Intel vacuum that existed for years prior to Ryzen, this would be amazing. You look at these numbers and applaud Intel for a 12% performance uplift with just clock tweaking, for the most part anyway, but for half the price. Of course, the price wouldn't be halved without AMD today, and the context of the 3950X and the pending Threader launches change this from a positive outcome to a dubious one. The 2990WX is the only Threader for part we can currently include on this chart out of the new ones, but six hours from now, we should have our Threader for 3 video up for more. In this one, the last gen 2990WX runs at 217K MIPS, proving that decompression does, in fact, like threads. As for compression, that shuffles the stack heavily. The 1950X gets demoted, the R9 3900X climbs, and the Intel CPUs in particular do much better here. In this chart, the 2990WX leads, followed by the overclocked 3950X, the 10980XE at 4.9 GHz follows next, plotting at 124,000 MIPS, or roughly equivalent to the 3950X at 4.4 GHz, and marginally ahead of the stock 3950X. The frequency in this one, in compression, really doesn't do anything for you. It's, it's all about just threads for the most part. The 1090DXE, 9980XE, and 7980XE stock CPUs all score within a few points of each other, which should be unsurprising when given the similarities. Chaos Group's V-Ray is next, another rendering application. In this one, the Intel i9-1090DXE completes its render in about 35 to 36 seconds when stock, putting it within test error and variance of the 9980XE and technically ahead of the 3950X, but functionally equivalent as they are within test variance of each other. Overclocking the 1090DXE puts it at 27 seconds to render, but that's not much of a change over the 9980DXE. The $1,700 2990WX holds the lead at 26 seconds, but again, check back for the TR3 review later as there's a cheaper part now. There's a $1,300 part we'll be looking at as well. Overclocking the Intel i9-1090DXE was easy. We used to use the EVGA Dark exclusively for this, but we're reserving that for XOC streams now, and I've switched to the Gigabyte X299X or its motherboard instead. For the 10980XE, we were able to sort of hold 5.0 to 5.1 GHz all core in non-AVX workloads, but we have to drop down to 4.9 for AVX workloads. This was with TJ Maxx pushed up to 110 degrees Celsius, meaning the allowance was up to 110, and we were, after steady state and blender, we were sitting at 98 or so. So we were really pushing the limit on what's achievable under closed loop liquid cooling. For our desktop component reviews, we use a Kraken X62 280 CLC for all testing, but for the HEDT parts, our Threadripper and Intel HED tests included, we use a 360 millimeter liquid cooler that offers full IHS coverage with the cold plate for each of the parts. So. Uh, Threadripper uses one that fits its cold plate and Intel for its own, both 360s. For the 10980XE, we use an EVGA CLC 360 at full speeds. 
The 1090DXE ended up at 4.9 gigahertz, 1.22 volts, set for an OC that passed all tests. We set mesh successfully between 32 and 34 as well, sitting at 32 for stable in all tests, uh, depending on the voltage used and how much thermal headroom we could permit. Power consumption's next. Blender power consumption gets kind of crazy with the overclock. With all the power limits disabled and a set voltage of 1.22 volts, the 10980XE holds 4.9 gigahertz at 521 watts at the EPS 12 volt cables. Remember that this doesn't include total system power draw, it's EPS 12 volt draw. So we're pretty close to the CPU's actual power consumption outside of VRM efficiency losses. The 9980XE at a set voltage of 1.12 volts held 4.5 gigahertz at 454 watts before becoming thermally constrained, which is why we always liked our 7980XE better. It can be delitted, which gives a lot more thermal headroom than the 9980XE, which is soldered and more of a pain to delid. The stock 10980XE runs at 254 watts for our Blender workload. Intel spec rates the PL1 and PL2 values as 165 watts and 198 watts respectively, with the turbo boost duration recommended at up to 32 seconds. It looks like Gigabyte is ignoring these turbo duration limits, but also all the other X299 boards that we've looked at exhibit similar behavior. So this seems to be the default for X299 rather than the exception. In the same chart, the 3950X stock CPU draws about 137 watts, the 2990WX in creator mode draws 197 watts for Blender sustained. So the 10980XE has become very inefficient. The power consumption required to achieve parity or slightly outmatch the 3950X is often disproportionate to the performance that's measured. Time Spy Extreme Physics is the next noteworthy one to look at. This gives us a less power intensive workload that would be comparable to heavy physics processing in games, for example. For this one, the power limits are more closely followed. The 10980XE stock CPU pulls 180 watts for this physics processing benchmark, which puts it equal to the 9900KS at 5.2 gigahertz and 1.32 volts. The overclocked 10980XE pulls 318 watts with the 3950X at 154 watts for an OC and 114 watts when stock. And again, check back for thread for three later in the day. Game testing is up now. We won't do too many of these since AGDT CPUs aren't too heavily focused on this use case and clearly you should just buy a cheaper processor if you're mostly gaming. This isn't a gaming part, nor is Threadripper, and they shouldn't be bought for gaming only machines, period. It'd not only be a waste of your money, but it also perform worse in almost every instance. That said, it's still worth testing this since a lot of people will use the same machine to play games after they're done with work. With Hitman 2 at 1080p and with DirectX 12, the 10980XE stock CPU runs at 121 FPS average, which is within error of the 9980XE at 122 FPS average. This is close to the 3900X and below the 3950X with the latter running at 127 FPS average for the stock result. None of this should be surprising. Threadripper also suffers hard in games as illustrated by the 2990WX in creator mode at the bottom of this chart. Not many games load this many cores efficiently and so we see the problems we have here. More cores doesn't mean it's at the top of the chart. Overclocking the 10980XE to 4.9 gigahertz shows that it can still get scaling out of its cores beyond the 9900KS, which runs at 144 FPS average when overclocked versus the 10980XE OC is 156 FPS average. 0.1% lows are never good in this game. We suspect it's something to do with DRM, but that's another story. Although 1% lows appear to scale predictably here. This is acceptable in this game when stock, but obviously isn't a first choice for gaming only and is a chart leader when overclocked, but again, obviously not good value. It's fine if you play games on the side though. 1440p gives us a GPU limited look at results. Shown here, we are now bound by the GPU at 142 FPS average, as our previous result allowed us to exceed 150. It's clearly a limit. The 10980XE stock CPU still holds 121. This is normal since the CPU load hasn't changed. And the 9980XE shows that it's still within error. The 3900X falls slightly below the 10980XE here, and the 3950X still leads by a few FPS. These differences are measurable, but they're not meaningful. You won't notice them in the game. Next is Civilization VI. We like this benchmark because it provides AI player turn time for calculating moves, which is a known annoyance for any players of turn-based strategy games. It's also a different metric than FPS, using time instead. 
The Intel i9-10980XE stock CPU requires an average of 32.9 seconds to process one turn, which places it about level with the 3900X. The 3950X stock CPU completes each turn in 31.4 seconds, with the overclocked 10980XE powering way ahead and hitting the 28 second mark. This game prefers frequency first, but obviously still has some use of more than 16 threads provided sufficient frequency. Despite being a good overclocker and technical chart leader, the 10980XE would still be better replaced by an Intel i9-9900K at half the power and similar clocks and price, with nearly equal results when overclocked. Shadow of the Tomb Raider at 1080p is up next, then we'll look at some more 1440p results. In a CPU-constrained scenario, the 10980XE stock CPU processes 151fps average, ranking it about even with the 7960X and 3900X. As for the parity with the 7960X, keep in mind that high core count can be detrimental in some games, particularly when boosting behavior will drag down the frequency with more cores in play. This results in less efficient resource utilization in games. At overclock, the 1090DXE pushes up against the 9900K SOC at around 171 FPS average. The 3950X, for reference, runs about 154 FPS average in this title, although it did have worse 0.1% lows in this game. Frame times become less consistent on higher core count CPUs in some games. In this instance, it's high core count AMD CPUs and Tomb Raider, but they are still playable and overall fine. We're not hitting any major stutters or anything like that. Assassin's Creed is next, first at 1080p and then at 1440p. The 10980XE runs at 133 FPS average in this one, allowing the stock 9900K a lead of 5.2%. This should be a good reminder that more cores doesn't equal more better in strictly gaming scenarios. The 3950X and 3900X are both the 134 to 136 FPS average range, just above the 10980XE stock CPU, which is at near parity with the 9980XE and 7980XE. At 1440p, a GPU constraint is enforced and everything loses rank. You can clearly see that we're GPU bound at the top section of results with the i9 and i7 CPUs all bunched up together and with an error and GPU bottlenecks of each other. The 10980XE OC sits just below the stock 9900K once again, with a stock CPU with an error of the 9980XE and 7980XE, albeit slightly below them. F1 2018 should be fun only because of its near total lack of a GPU limitation, although it is less of a realistic use case since no one really cares about playing F1 2018 at 1080p at 300 FPS, it's still here because it provides an unconstrained hierarchical stack. The other games fill more GPU binding needs. At 1080p, the 10980XE sits at 281 FPS average, with lows actually notably lower on this higher core count CPU. This is one of the downsides, but it's fortunately still playable overall, so even workstation users who want to game on the side shouldn't be negatively affected in a major way. 3950X runs just ahead of this with better lows, but overclocking the 1090DXE somewhat surprisingly shoves it to the top of the stack. These games are getting stuck, needing more speed to use the cores, and once given that speed, the CPU picks up big time. Its frame time performance is still worse than a 9900K though. 1440p has its GPU bound, clearly has its now shunted into the 230 FPS range. The 10980XE, 9980XE, and 7980XE are all within the same realm of performance when limited to 1440p. For the last one, we'll look briefly at Total War Warhammer 2's campaign benchmark, which shows us one of the worst performances for HEDT CPUs. Last time, we showed the 3950X doing poorly here, down at R5 2600 levels of performance, and this time, the 10980XE joins the 3950X toward the bottom of the chart. It's sitting right next to the R7 at 3.9 GHz. That's not great, it's playable, but for this CPU, it's really not good. The overclock does help and gives it a tremendous 28% performance uplift, but that sort of fizzles out when realizing that it's tied with an i7 7700K, i5 9600K, or R7 3700X part with an OC. That's not to say any of these are necessarily bad, but they're certainly not $1,000 parts, and this is just a byproduct of using an HEDT CPU to play games. Conclusions then, for the 10980XE, this CPU is actually pretty hard to justify. We weren't expecting it to be quite as... don't really like... I try to avoid sensationalizing things, but wasn't expecting it to be quite as much of a, a bloodbath as it was in some of these tests. The 3950X has really impressive performance for where we wouldn't typically expect a 16-core part on Ryzen architecture, on Zen architecture, like say Zen, the, f the first iteration or maybe the half-step iteration, the 2000 series. You wouldn't really expect a 16-core part from that era to get the type of performance that it does in some of these games where it's even managing to outpace the 1090DXE in a lot of instances stock to stock. Now, Intel has a lot of overhead an impressive amount for overclocking, and that's been true for a while. Might not always be true, but it is right now. When you overclock the 1090XE, in games it can get upwards of 27% performance uplift, but that's 
obviously not really a justification to buy it because you can just buy a 9900K, do it for half the power and get the same performance. So that's not really a great, it's not a defense of buying the product. Uh, however, the Intel, the interesting thing with Intel here is that the 3950X running stock outpacing the 10980X stock starts more of that paradigm shift where, where AMD had its biggest weakness previously, frequency, games, stuff like that, as opposed to thread loads. AMD is now starting to actually do pretty okay there. So it's interesting. The next benchmark, the kind of seminal Intel benchmarks of the past would be Photoshop. That's still on their favor. The 9900K, far better value than a 3950X or a 10980XE especially for a Photoshop only workload. We obviously don't test every single aspect of Photoshop, but we use the Puget Suite and hit a lot of it. So with the Puget Suite, you do things like uh, filtration, application, there's transforms, warps, um, there's translates, like just moving stuff around, resizes, scaling of images within like uh, rasters, stuff like that. So it does a lot. And the 9900K still performs best overall there. So it's a frequency bound application. 10980XE never would have been really a preferred choice for that, just like the 79 and 99 weren't. The next one would be Premiere. And Premiere, the 10980XE is where you would expect it to really get the recommendation. So Threadripper, the 2990WX, for whatever reason, doesn't like our 4K60 test we do. Everything else seems to scale fine with it. 2990WX really struggles with it. It does okay in the 1080p ENG RNG style shoot that we render in the other test, but not in the 4K one. And that's a matter of every different test of Premiere is going to have slightly different performance because Premiere has a lot of different things in it and they impact CPUs in different ways. So in that benchmark, the 1090DXE does pretty well in both of the bench in both of the tests, but the 3950X is such competitive value and so close in scoring that it's hard to justify a 1090DXE. And if you want to spend more, the 3175X, we need to retest, but that was previously really the, the one that did extremely well there. So it does scale with cores, up to 28 at least, but uh, seems to depend a bit on architecture. So uh, should you buy the 10980XE? Well, with a $1,000 price cut coming down to $1,000, I saw some people had issue with the, word, the phrase price cut before because technically it's a launch price, so it's not a cut. Well, except it is though, because the 7980DXE was $2,000. The 9980DXE was $2,000. Both of those dropped to about $1,000 a couple of weeks ago. They've been fluctuating in between. So they've been about a grand. The 10980DXE at $1,000, it was supposed to be a more expensive part, but AMD puts Intel in a position where Intel can't do that. So it's functionally a price cut. And at $1,000, the 10980DXE, Going into this, we really expected it to be a lot more competitive than it was because relative to Intel, it's a tremendous change. But it's just, for the most part, we're looking at a 3950X recommendation uh, for this type of workload. But if you're not in the business of saving money, if you're in the business of doing business, you don't care about the couple hundred bucks that you save by going down a step and you want the best, well, then check back for the Threader for three reviews. Honestly, I haven't looked at the data yet. I don't know where it'll land. And also check back for our 3175X revisit whenever we get around to that, because that's probably going to be a pretty important one for you to look at as well. So 10980XE though, we can't firmly recommend it in any instance. There are plenty of instances we went through in here. I'm not gonna go through all the, the whole video again, but where we don't recommend it. And then there's a few where it starts to kind of pull ahead in a way that's not bad, but just it's not that compelling. So the processor, as a processor, in a vacuum, ignoring everything else, all competition, is a good product. And then looking at previous Intel parts is a good product, but looking at the wider scope of things with AMD now in the, in the view, it's just not that competitive. It's not competitive. It's at best at parity. So not a great place to be. What we need to do is probably check back for liquid nitrogen overclocking to see if there's maybe some enthusiast interest there. But the 3950X has been really doing really well in Allen 2 stuff as well, so we'll see. Anyway, that's it for this one. Thanks for watching. Check back in a few hours from time of this publication for our Thread Over 3 reviews and subscribe for more. Go to store.gamersnexus.net to help out our in-depth reporting directly. 
You can buy things like our shirts, mod mats, or toolkits, and you can go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus if you'd like to support us there and get some behind-the-scenes videos. Thanks for watching. We'll see you all next time.